Chapter 12 A Not So Charming Evening The twins left with Froggy and read shortly after receiving the letter about the happily ever after assembly. The four of them rode in one carriage while all of Red's necessary luggage was carried in a separate carriage behind them. The twins felt sorry for the heroes, for the horses pulling the second carriage. It seemed like a heavy heave. They had half a dozen soldiers surrounding them as they traveled, which Froggy insisted was the perfect amount for safety, but not enough to cause any unwanted attention. Halfway there, they came to a stop so Red could change into the enormous gown their scheme required. They pulled into a tiny field between two large oak trees, and Red transformed the first carriage into a dressing room. She kicked Connor and... Froggy out and made Alex stay inside to help her dress. It was definitely a challenge, as the gown was much bigger than the inside of the carriage. I just hope to point out that Queen Snow White has never changed down the side of the road, Red said, struggling to pull the heavy dress over her head. I suppose that's what I get for being an elected queen. It must be some consultation. I... To know you were wanted, Alex said, trying to help Red move through the dress. They actually chose you to lead their kingdom. It wasn't just handed to you. Not really, Red said. After the crawl revolution, it was between me and the third little pig, and he didn't even want the job. <laughs> he was a total recluse. He barely came out of that brick house, and he was proud of it. And with one last effort, Red pushed herself up through the center of the gown. There we go, she said out of breath. The boys rejoined them inside the carriage, and the procession continued to the Charming Kingdom. Charming Palace. There was physical, physically no room for anything else inside the carriage, with the four bodies and the amount of endless red fabric crammed inside. Oh, no, Red said, after they had been on the move for less than five minutes. What is it, Connor asked, with his face pressed against him. Oh, the tinkle, Fred Pete. <laughs> Everyone else in the carriage, carriage groaned. The following evening, Queen Red's party arrived at the Charming Palace. The twins couldn't resist all Jean, all of the storybook Estates and villages they pass on the way to the palace's front steps. Something seemed different about the Charming Kingdom, though the twins couldn't put their finger on it. Even beyond the lack of villagers parading through the streets and trading in shops, there was a very gloomy vibe that floated through the whole kingdom. The carriages rolled up to the bottom of the lengthy staircase leading out to the palace's entrance, and the twins were re leave to finally be carrying out the compact carriage. <sighs> Pardon me. They didn't care how grim they were under Red's dress. They were greeted by a palace footman. Froggy immediately jumped out of the carriage and boised them into an unloading the luggage in the second carriage. The twins both hopped out of the carriage and crouched on the ground. Fred was next to hop out and land directly in the middle of them. Her gown exploded out of the carriage and securely covered the twins below her. It was perfect. So far, so good, Alex whispered under Red's dress. Nice bloomers, Red, Connor said, chuckling under about the knee-length undershorts she had strategically put on. Fred grunted and kneed Alex in the head. Ouch! That was me, Red, Alex said. Apologies, Red said, and kneed Connor in the head. Ouch! Connor yelled. Froggy walked back to find Red and twins perfectly in position. Are you ready for this, Froggy asked. I think so, Alex said. Roger, Roger, Connor said. That's reassuring, Froggy said, and used a handkerchief to wipe the beads of sweat on his forehead, because I most certainly am not. Take a chill pill, Frog, Connor said. No one is going to know we're under here. The footman glanced over suspiciously from the second carriage, positive he had just heard voices from bodies that weren't visible. 
Make sure you two stay as silent as possible under there, Froggy said, and gulped his so hard he croaked. Let's make our way into the palace, shall we? Fred took a step forward, and the, the twins weren't ready for it. Fred, we can't see anything. You're going to have to guide us, Connor whispered her. And how am I supposed to do that? Red whispered down at him. Narrate what you're doing, Alex said. Close, Red closed her eyes and took a deep breath, mentally preparing herself for the evening she was in for. Fine, I'm walking towards the stairs, Red informed them, and they moved with her. She was walking too fast for them to keep up. Take baby steps, Connor whispered. We're crouched down here like chimpanzees. Red's nostrils flared. Sure, she said sharply. Now I'm walking slowly up the stairs. The first few steps were a disaster. Con Froggy kept gasping every time he saw one of their sneakers peeking out from under the gown. Slowly but surely, they managed to get the hang of it and smoothly made their way up the enormous flight of stairs. Back at the carriages, the footman could have sworn he saw three pairs of feet under Red's dress out of the corner of his eye. But when he double-checked, they were gone. The footman continued unloading the second carriage, a sign he just needed glasses. Born to retire. Alex's and Connor's backs were starting to ache from crawling up the stairs like monkeys, but only got worse when they reached the top of the stairs and the ground became flat, causing them to slouch even more. And now I'm walking toward the palace entrance. No more steps, Red said out loud. A few of the Chiming Kingdom guards patrolling the entrance looked at her funny. After all, she was walking at a snail's pace and talking to herself. You certainly are, Froggy said to Red and patted her back, trying to reduce the awkwardness. Prince Charlie, welcome back, sir, the twins heard a familiar voice say. Sir Lampton, Froggy clarified him. Good to see you, although I wish the visit were... For a different occasion. Alex and Connor tensed up, knowing Sir Lampton was just a few feet away from them. They held their breath, af afraid he 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 hear even that. Now I'm walking inside the charming palace, Red said to the twins, but was caught by Sir Lampton. Um, and I can't believe it. Feels like I was home just a minute ago. Such a quick trip. It was a decent cover, but from under the gown, the twins could feel the suspicious gaze Lampton was giving Red. I feel all right, Your Majesty, Lampton asked her. You're walking so slowly. Are you ill? Alex and Connor exchanged a glance, wondering how Red was going to cover this one. Perfectly fine, said Lampton, Red. I just selected the wrong pair of shoes to travel in. My feet are killing me. Red and Connor sighed with relief. Connor gave Red a thank you pat on knee. She quickly slapped his head through the gown, and Connor bit his fit in silence of scream. Just a hitch, Red said with a tight smile. How are things here, Froggy asked, trying to distract Lampton. Terrible, he said. Have you heard? I'm guessing not, Froggy said. What happened? Lampton let out a most troubled sigh in the twins had ever heard. Princess Hope was kidnapped last night. The twins gasped, unable to contain their shock, but it was covered by the gasps coming from Red and Froggy. What? Froggy said. Devastated by the news about his only niece. What do you mean kidnapped? By whom? Rumpelstiltskin, Sir Lampton said. It looks like he's working for the Enchantress again, only this time... He succeeded. It grew quiet. The whole world seemed to be falling apart for everyone. A few moments later, after traveling across the red carpeted interior of the charming palace entrance hall, the twins knew they had arrived inside the ballroom, recognizing the golden dance floor beneath them. The floor was filled with troubled voices and impatient footsteps milling about. Here, your majesty, please have a seat, the twins heard Sir Lampton say. Thank you, Red said. Now I'm going to slowly sit on the stool so I've graciously been provided with. Twinge cringed from the elegance of Red's statement, but thankfully everyone else in the room was too occupied to have even noticed Red and Froggy enter the room. She slowly sat on the stool and placed behind her, giving the twins enough time to adjust themselves to her seated position, sitting on the floor beside her. 
It was a relief to all their joints. The twins could hear small conversations from all corners of the room. They wished they could put faces to the voices they heard. Connor nudged Alex and quietly gestured to a loose seam she found in Red's dress. He carefully pulled the seam apart even more and created a small hole to peek out. Alex did the same on her side and they were finally able to see the outside of the gown. Although they knew everyone in the room, there was so much heartache and hopelessness worn off. All the faces, the kings and queens, were almost unrecognizable. It was hard to, for the twins to see them all like this. Their lives had always been perfect examples of happiness. But here they were now, the most distraught group of people they'd ever seen. Queen Cinderella was seated on her throne, devastated beyond belief. Her hands covered her swollen eyes as tears rolled down her face. She was comforted by Queen Snow White and Queen Rapunzel, who used the tip of her remarkably long braid to dry Cinderella's tears. The men paced around in the corner of the ballroom. King Chance never stopped moving, furious that his daughter had been taken from him. King Chandler and Rapunzel's husband stood near him, unable to do anything but watch. Froggy joined him, leaned his support with his presence. Last night, I heard her crying, and Cinderella told the woman at her throne. I got out of bed and went to her room. A few of the maids were on their way inside, but I insisted on checking her myself. But when I opened the door, the first thing I saw were the curtains blowing inside. I thought it was strange, and I didn't remember leaving her window open. And that's when I saw him, that horrid little man holding my daughter. Heavy streams of tears flowed down the queen's face. Rapunzel rubbed her back and Snow White held her hand tightly. Breathe, Cinderella, breathe, Snow White told her. Cinderella caught her breath and continued. Then he, he looked me right in the eye and hopped out the window. I screamed and ran down the windowsill, trying to see if I could see them below. But they were gone, she said. That disgusting man just sat there with my baby. Snow White held her and she cried onto her shoulder. This is my fault, soft voice across the room. Queen Sleeping Beauty stood at the window in the back of the ballroom, listlessly staring at the land outside. I'm the one she wants. I'm the one she's after, Sleeping Beauty said on the stage. Why, does she why doesn't she just take me? Why does she have to make everyone else suffer? This isn't your fault, Rapunzel said. You can't blame yourself for this, Noah agreed. Kane Chance grew tired and patient and groaned angrily. He needed someone to blame. Where are those useless fairies, he demanded, and why haven't they done something about this yet? A soft breeze blew through the ballroom, and twinkling lights of all colors of the rainbow floated through the room. The fairy council slowly peered out of thin air. Emerelda was first to appear. We're doing everything in our power, she said. She was tall, black, and beautiful. She wore a long emerald gown that matched her eyes and jewelry. Emerelda always had a soft but authoritative presence. She was someone you could trust, but never wanted to cross. Xanthios was next to arrive and was followed by Skylene, the blue fairy. She had pale skin, hair of the color of the sky, and robes the color of the ocean. Tangerina appeared shortly after her. She was the orange fairy, and actual bees flew around her beehive. Violetta, the purple fairy, the oldest of the council, popped up close to where Ren and twins were sitting. Rosette was short, plump, and rosy cheeked road fairy. Appear next. Coral, the youngest, and the pink fairy showed up shortly after and hovering in the air thanks to her tiny wings. The fairy's colorful arrivals were a bright, beautiful sight, but not beautiful enough to raise the spirits in the room. Well, it's not enough, King Chance yelled at them. The Enchantress is, the, is one of you, isn't she? You outnumbered her. Why can't you handle this? We are greater than her in size, but not in strength, said Sakaileen in her dreamlike voice. She's managed to grow more powerful than you ever imagined, Xanthio said. I'm afraid even the fairy godmother is no match of her. Speaking of the fairy godmother, has she or Mother Goose arrived yet, Emerilda asked, looking around the ballroom. We need to begin. Another short breeze flew, blew through the room, this time carrying white sparkling lights that circled into a vortex in the center of the room. A moment later, the twins' grandmother appeared with her crystal wand raised. 
The twins looked nervously at each other. Now that their grandmother was here, they were officially in the same room as everyone they wanted to avoid. Forgive me for being late, the fairy godmother said, and politely acknowledged everyone in the room with a comfy nod. There was a bit of an issue in the other world. The twins had never heard the world referred as anything else but home before. It was odd to hear it have a name of its own, although not entirely surprising. What else had the fairies been calling it this entire time? Red Riding Hood, my word. That is quite a dress you're wearing, the fairy godmother said. When she saw Red Sin in the oversized gown, Alex and Connor could hear each other's heartbeats and were terrified they were about to be discovered. Well, Red said nervously, thinking as quickly as possible, it's important to dress your best when the world is at its worst. To raise morals. Yes, I suppose it's true, the fairy godmother said, though she didn't sound fully convinced. With all due respect, I don't believe this is the proper time to be thinking about dresses in the other world, King Chance said, his frustration building every second spent without his daughter. Well, Grandmother Gooseby joined us, Amarilda asked, getting to the me back on track. The twins' grandmother dropped the subject of Red's dress. No, she stayed behind the other world, she said. My grandchildren are missing, and she so she agreed to continue searching for them while we have our discussion. That's horrible, Red said, shaking her head a tad too much. I hope they're all right. I just love those two so much. Alex and Connor shared a mutual eye roll. Is everyone else here? The fairy godmother asked. So I and Alex strange, read strangely. Everyone but the elves, ma'am. Sir Lampton informed her from the side of the room. We sent word of our meeting to the elf empire, but they have chosen to miss it. Feeling the current situation has nothing to do with them. Kane Chandler sighed. Typical, he said. The elves never get involved unless they have to. Thank you, Sir Lampton, the fairy godmother said. Then let's begin. Kane Chan stormed up to her. Tell us why the Enchantress can't be stopped. Why of all you so incompetent? He shouted. The fairy godmother looked at him with her trademark compassion. Chance, I'm afraid I don't have your answers. Is Mia is just as big a mystery to me as she is to all of you. Then tell us what you know, Chance ordered. Where did this monster come from? What is she after now? Seep and Beauty took a few steps forward, the fairy godmother. I'm willing to give myself up to her if that's what she's after, she said. My dear, you're not responsible for any of this, the fairy godmother said. I'm afraid I'm the one who's entirely the blame. Ismia wouldn't be here if it wasn't for me. All the fairies lowered their heads, knowing the fairy godmother was telling the truth. What do you mean, fairy godmother? Cinderella asked. Surely, someone like you couldn't be accountable for... A creature like that? The fairy godmother closed her eyes, took a deep breath, deciding where to begin. There is so much to tell and not enough time to tell it. It all starts centuries ago. One of my first visits to the other world, the fairy godmother explained. It was a horrible time in that world. There was plague and war everywhere you looked. Today, they refer to the period as the Dark Ages. And there couldn't be a better description Sometimes the air would be filled with so much smoke from all destruction, the sun would be hidden for days at a time. I discovered a little girl all alone in the middle of the forest, no more than five years old. She was crying and was covered in ash and dirt. She told me that her name was Ismia and that she had lived in the village nearby. Like many of the villages at the time, hers had been invaded by a group of barbaric soldiers. They swept through the village and killed everyone in their path, including the family. The soldiers discovered Ismia hiding in the barn. However, when they tried harming her, the girl was able to defend herself using magic. She told me she had started a giant fire with just her hands, and it consumed her entire village and all the soldiers with it. The girl told me to her village so I could see the damage for myself, and it was devastating. Not only had the villagers perished, but all the land around the town for acres was destroyed. I knew then that this girl was no ordinary child. Magic has always been a mysterious thing, but I'm absolutely astonished that a child in the middle of another dimension could have such capabilities. But for whatever reason, 
Magic had found this girl and had saved her life. I believe my discovering her was no accident. I didn't think she would survive the other world on her own, so I brought her back to our world. I knew she was special because when we arrived in the fairy kingdom, the unicorns bowed, the fairy godmother said. Connor looked at his sister. The unicorns had bowed to them when the fairies, when they first traveled to the fairy kingdom. What did it mean? As Mia was raised here, the fairy godmother continued, we taught her how to use her magic and become a fairy. Her powers grew with time, and she proved herself to be one of the most gifted fairies the fairy kingdom has ever seen. Ismia was also the kindest, most honest, loving young woman I had ever known. She was so thankful I had brought her, brought her to live in our world and received so much joy from helping others. I loved her like a daughter, and she became my apprentice. I was certain when my time came to the end, I could leave this world safely in her hands. I was positive she would be the next fairy godmother. We created the happily ever after assembly in hopes that Ismia would lead it someday. But as Ismia grew into adulthood, she had changed. Things were going on beyond our knowledge. Things we couldn't see. And she became another person altogether. She became aggressive and mean-spirited. Her interest in fairy life faded completely. Helping people became a chore for her, and she started abusing her magic. It was during our first official meeting as the Happily Ever After Assembly that I knew Ismia was no longer the little girl I saved in the other world. We hadn't officially appointed a leader of the Assembly yet, so I was presenting. The trolls and the goblins had just been sanctioned in their own territory, territory, but they were still enslaving innocent people from other kingdoms. I asked the rest of the Assembly what the best solution was. Ismia blurred out, why don't we just drown them all? Thumbelina stream practically runs through their territory. Just break a dam and be done with them. We can make it look like an accident. She always seemed amused by the idea. Naturally, after an outburst like that, we couldn't appoint her head of the assembly as planned. We appointed Emerelda and the fairy council instead. When Ismia found out that she had been replaced, she was enraged. She went on a tirade, disassociating herself from the assembly and the fairy kingdom altogether. She changed her entire appearance and refused to be known as a fairy, deeming herself an enchantress instead. The next time we crossed paths with Ismia was at the Sleeping Beauty's christening. She was uninvited, but we knew she could come anyway. We discovered Rumpelstiltskin had been working for her when he tried kidnapping Sleeping Beauty and were confronting her about her. Ismia lost control and went on a rampage, cursing the princess to die after pricking her finger on the spindle of a spinning wheel. However, I knew the curse wasn't only going to affect Sleeping Beauty. Ismia's powers were too strong for that. A amount of rage could be aimed at just an innocent child. Luckily, I was able to convert the curse into a harmless sleeping spell, and when she pricked her finger on a spinning wheel, as planned, the entire kingdom was affected, confirming my suspicions. Ismia disappeared after the christening, and we never saw her again. We searched everywhere, but found no trace of her. Later, word reads that she had been poisoned by the same toxins that left the upper eastern kingdom bare. We figured she might have died and stopped our search. Unfortunately, we were wrong. A year ago, my grandchildren accidentally found a way into this world and went missing. While I was searching for them, I made a troubling discovery. Small weeds started to grow in the northwest, where the flowers and grass had grown. The land had received itself from the poison. Except the poison was obliterated everything good that had come from the soil, and the weeds had taken its place. I knew it then. It would only be a matter of time before Ismia resurfaced. I alerted the fairy council at once, and we spent the last year actively searching for her, but found nothing to lead us in the right direction. It wasn't until her recent attack in the Eastern Kingdom that we were positive she had returned. The crowd in the ballroom was even tenser after hearing Ismia's sword. And why can't we stop her now, King Chance demanded. If her spells can be converted back then, 
Why can't we get a grip of them anymore? That's what I'm trying to tell you, the fairy godmother said. We taught her everything she knows. We taught her how. How to use magic from her heart. We had trained her to channel it from a good source. That's why every spell she ever cast could be altered. But when she was poisoned, everything good that was left in her soul was killed. Now is Mia's powers come from a place of darkness and anger. Forces that we fairies don't stand a chance against. And believe me, as Mia has a lot of anger to feed off of. Alex and Connor couldn't believe what she was saying. Was their grandmother enunciating that the Enchantress was unstoppable? So, what do we do, Snow White asked. The fairy godmother lowered her eyes and looked down at the floor, hating to say it was much as they hated hearing it. I don't know, she said softly. And with that, whatever hoped had survived was obliterated. It was the fairy godmother had told them the world was over. Suddenly, all the windows burst open, and a monstrous wind blew inside the ballroom, knocking Sleeping Beauty to the ground. A gigantic bolt of lightning hit the floor so hard the entire palace buckled. In its blinding flash, the enchantress appeared. She was the most majestic person the twins had ever seen. Her hair and cape flowed through the ballroom, and although her mouth was still, her eyes smiled evilly enough with her long eyelashes. Hope I'm not late, as Mia said. I do love a good story, especially when it's mine. Alex and Connor clutched onto each other under red dress. Everyone in the room was frozen in fear. Don't tell me you're having another party without inviting me, as Mia said, going into all the royals and fairies around her. You think you've learned your lesson from the last time you didn't include me. A smirk appeared on her face. Cinderella was the only person who moved. She jumped out of her throat and ran straight toward the enchantress with a fist raised. King Chandler and Froggy were quick to grab hold of her, but she lunged with such determination Rapunzel's husband had to join them in, holding her back. You horrible witch, Cinderella screamed, strong against her brother's-in-law. Magic or no magic, I'll pull you apart limb from limb if you hurt my daughter. As Nia just laughed at her. What have you done with our daughter, you monster chance yelled. Amarelda and Skyly placed their hands on his shoulders to keep him from charging toward her. She's alive, for now, as Mia said, and cautiously examined her nails. I hope there are no hard feelings. I'll give her back to you once I'm done with her. Maybe. What do you want with Princess Hope, as Mia, the fairy godmother, demanded. As Mia squinted at the fairy godmother and walked in a circle around her, closely examining her former teacher. Why, if it isn't the big FG herself, she said. You're looking rather old, Grams. Is something on your mind? Is something troubling you? Don't be cheeky, as Mia. It's a shade you'll never, you never wore well, the fairy godmother said. As Mia frowned at her playfully, you're going to put it on this noble face. But I know better, she said. Have you told them what I took from you yet? Or have you left that part of your story out because you're, you're afraid they would worry more, knowing you're just as terrified as the rest of them? The fairy godmother kept her silent, not giving in to as Mia's games. Fine, I'll tell them, as Mia said, and face the rest of the room. I have her granddaughter. Everyone in the room aghast, including the twins. What was she talking about? Alex wondered. The fairy godmother looked puzzled as well. One of the enchantress had managed to get a hold of Alex as well as Charlotte. My granddaughter? The fairy godmother asked. As Mia rolled her eyes. Oh, don't look su so surprised. I took her weeks ago. Yet to have known... I left you plenty of clues. The fairy godmother looked at Ismail with the most neutral face she could muster. How did you get to her? she asked. It was simple, as most things are for me, Ismail said with a small shrug. I saw that I saw that book of yours, the old one with all our history in it. The portal. I cast a tiny spell on it and was able to pluck her straight out of the underworld. I said, bring me the Bailey girl from the place where the fairy godmother, precious Bailey family resides. And that was all. Stupid woman. She didn't even pretend to be someone else. 
She told me exactly who she was right from the beginning. Alex grabbed Connor's hand and they locked eyes. She thinks mom is me, Alex whispered to her brother. And mom must be going along with it, Connor whispered. But why was she taken instead of you? Alex clutched Connor's shoulder as the answer came to her. Connor, I was in my honors class when mom was missing. I was in the next town. I was in the place where I reside. That's why she got mom instead. The fairy godmother began nodding her head, Colin coming to the same conclusion as the twins. She leaped over the re to Red and stared down at a huge gown again. The twins could have sworn she was looking straight at them. Did she know they were under there? Whatever they did or didn't know, it made the fairy godmother stand a little taller, know the enchantress had made a grave mistake. Element, you have our attention now, the fairy godmother said, quickly looking back to Azmia. So what is it you want from us? Why have you graced us with your presence tonight? A menacing smile grew on the enchantress' face. This is the part she has been waiting two centuries to tell them. As you may have guessed, I've decided to take over the world, as Mia said, matter-of-factly, with a small yarn. But rather than continuing to show you examples of my powerful wrath, I decided to give you an opportunity that will make all your lives easier. I want you all to renounce your thrones and hand over your kingdoms to me willingly. The entire room erupted in outrage. The men had to strain Cinderella once again. Never a chance, shouted, and speaking for everyone in the room. Even the entire kingdom consumed and a young princess's life at stake. There is still some hesitation, Ismia said, shaking her head. I'm going to take over. It is unpreventable. I'm giving you a chance to accept your defeat with dignity. You'd be wise to take it. No one moved or made a sound under Ismia's heavy glare. She turned to Sleeping Beauty, who was still on the floor, trembling under the enchantress' gaze. Why don't you do it first, Sleeping Beauty, Ismia said. Show your fellow rulers how easy it is. Your kingdom has been through enough already. Wouldn't you agree? Ease their sufferings. Do it for your people, for your husband. If you're, if you hand me over your kingdom, I will release it from my enchanted plants. Do we have a deal? All was quiet while Sleeping Beauty contemplated the impossible decision. Snow White and Rapunzel shook their heads, urging her not to give in. Finally, Sleeping Beauty stood up and slowly walked over to stand behind the fairy godmother. Any partnership I make will be made against you, Sleeping Beauty said. And my people would accept nothing less. All the monarchs and fairies looked to one another, inspired by Sleeping Beauty's beauty, bravery. One by one, they walked across the ballroom and stood behind the fairy godmother, showing the enchantress where their loyalties would remain. As Mia was beside herself with rage, the twins were positive they could see small flames flickering from her eyes. You're all making the greatest mistake in your reign, she said, but don't worry, they'll be ending soon. The fairy godmother took a few confident steps towards his Mia. No one in this room may be able to stop you, Mia, but the fairy godmother said, the fairy godmother said, and then glanced in the twins' direction, but I have nothing but the highest confidence someone unrevealed will find a way. Alex and Connor looked at each other. Her words were so carefully chosen. Was she talking about them? As Mia's anger turned to amusement, and she let a, a long laugh. I see, she said. You all think you're safe standing behind your precious fairy godmother. Well, in case you think of her promising words alone can save you, Allow me to clarify. As Mia reached an open hand toward the fairy godmother, a gigantic bolt of lightning erupted from it, hit the fairy godmother, and she disappeared. A turquoise jar appeared in the enchantress' hand, and a ghostly version of the fairy godmother appeared inside it. What about the rest of you doing now? Did I have the fairy godmother's soul? As Mia asked the room. Alex kind of squirmed frantically around Red's gown. Alex had to hold her brother back as he tried running toward the enchantress like Cinderella. She's got grandmother come, whispered. Back in his sister long ago, she's got grandma. She can't know we're here, Connor, Alex whispered back to him. Concerned, this is my final warning, as, as Mia declared. 
to the crowd. My attacks on your kingdom will continue until you surrender to me. We'll see where you stand, where all your people are begging you to keep the suffering end. Your days of happily ever after are over. Another gigantic bolt of lightning hit the palace and the enchantress disappeared, taking the fairy godmother with her. Every little one in the room was as pale as Snow White. The twins froze inside Red's gown and with their hearts broken. No one knew what to do. All the kings, queens, and fairies searched from the s for some sign of optimism in one another's eyes. There was none to be found. For the first time in history, the leaders in the fairy tale were world were hope helpless. All right, that is the end of the first reading in a couple months. I hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to hear more from the land of stories, the enchantress returns, and plenty more books in the future. Also, if you want to hear more books later on, any recommendations, don't forget to comment those in the videos. And also, I'll be happy to look it up on Pinterest and on any other ideas. And I hope you enjoy the reading. Bye!